If you've ever experienced a glitch in the Matrix and would like to share it with the channel, just go to AsTheRavenDreams.com and click the button to do so. And of course, thank you. I just want to say that I found your podcast a few months ago and I can't stop listening. Thank you for telling these stories and giving people a place to connect. Keep up the good work, Raven. Thank you. I'm not really sure what category this would fall into, as I don't know what really happened. I've also never told anyone, so I'm going to try my best to get this out in a coherent manner. Here's some backstory. I worked at a restaurant back in 2004, when I was about 19. It was 25 minutes away from my house, which was in another town. Now, I live in a smallish town in southeast Texas, so it's not uncommon to work in one and live in another adjacent town. This being the case, there was really only one way there and back, so I drove in the same dark stretch of road every night. Also noteworthy is the fact that this is a road between two small towns, and it was late. So, it wasn't very common to see other cars at this time, though it did happen. This particular night, I was leaving work as usual after hanging out for a while after my shift. It's a server thing, we never go home right after work. I was completely sober, not overly tired as I hadn't even worked a double shift that day, and overall I felt pretty clear-headed, even though it was around 11pm. I was a bit of a night owl back then, and now I do have to admit that I drove this exact stretch of road for years, and sometimes I would zone out for lack of a better term. I wasn't unsafe, it's just like... You know when you're driving and then realize, wow, I don't remember driving for a second. Yeah, it's pretty unsafe, I guess, but I don't know how else to explain it. Regardless, I know that I hadn't zoned out this time. I'm very aware of my actions before and after what I'm about to tell you. Anyway, I'm in the middle of the only large curve this road has between the restaurant and the entrance to my neighborhood, it's an otherwise pretty straight shot, except this curve that goes to the right. I remember looking down to change the radio station, I know, I know, keep my eyes on the road, especially during a curve, when I had this overwhelming feeling to look to my left, out the window. Remember, my car is leaning right, I'm going towards the right in this curve, it was such a fleeting feeling, but at the same time, it felt like time had slowed down, if that makes sense. Mind you, this is a dark stretch of road, with nothing but trees on the left side, and I knew this. I've driven it hundreds of times. I know that I can't see anything to my left on this part of the road specifically, aside from moonlight-type shadows. So... Almost as if involuntarily, I turned my head to the left, and there was me, just there in the road, right next to my driver's side window. In the moment, it was so fast. I mean, let's be honest, there are no other cars I'm trying to get home. Yeah, I was definitely speeding. But time seemed to slow down for a split second, like I was watching a scene somehow. I was there next to my window and time stopped for a second, or at least thinking back about it, it felt like it had. The other me was there looking right at me. No expression, no nothing. The scariest part to me was that she was wearing exactly what I had on that day, right down to my server apron that I still hadn't taken off. Had the same clothes, the same hair, the same black rimmed glasses. I don't mean that I was seeing my reflection in the window. I mean there was a person who looked exactly like me, standing in the road, 
facing my car looking down into my window. Like, my reflection would have shown my hand on the wheel, but hers were down by her side. Trust me, for a long time, I tried to convince myself that I was just seeing my reflection. It felt like an eternity that I was locked eyes with her, or me, but it was literally a fraction of a second. Like I said, I was definitely speeding, and I didn't hit the brakes when this happened. It was just as fast as any other time you look to the left or right while driving. Now, as I mentioned, there aren't many other cars on the road this late at night. But just as I looked back towards the road, very, very shaken I might add, there was a car coming my way in the curve. Yes, I'm still in the curve. That's how fast all this happened. This car had crossed over the middle turn lane and was drifting into my lane. I had looked up at the exact right time to be able to swerve out of its way. While it continued across the double lines and then correcting itself after I was past it. So, was this me warning myself? Was I seeing a me from a different timeline? And possibly after crashing with the other car? Almost 20 years have passed, and I cannot get this out of my head. Did I die that night and jump into another timeline? I got married and had kids not long after this happened, and I don't live near either town anymore. I haven't driven that stretch of road in almost 17 years now, and honestly it scares me a little bit to think about it now. I had no idea what glitches or any of this was back then, and the more I go down these rabbit holes, the more that night is just a mystery to me. So if anyone has an idea, feel free. Also, like I said, I've never told anyone or written this out, so if I left anything out I apologize, and I hope it's not too confusing. But thank you for reading. During my time at uni, me and my ex-girlfriend, just close friend at the time, had a weird glitch-like experience that always baffled us. We were in our second year of gathering hall room, which was also the cafeteria slash waiting area for certain things. It's usually very busy and noisy. Furthermore, there was an announcement held in this area when we were there, and during this time everyone was waiting for the announcement to happen. Me and my friend were so involved with our conversation that we kind of blocked out all the external noise and stayed invested in the convo. My friend was taking videos at the time, and she left her phone on record without realizing it. Fast forward a few minutes of our conversation, we notice that everyone is completely silent, and just looking at us, and then the announcement starts. We were so embarrassed, but we didn't notice everyone had gone silent and it felt like we spoke for 5 to 10 seconds. Regardless, it was an embarrassing moment. Fast forward a couple of hours, we go on with our day and return to our student house. Then my friend comes to me and tells me she has come across the most uncanny thing and can't describe how she feels. She shows me the video and I listen to it thinking nothing of it. The video starts when she mistakenly left it on record, and it just has us invested in our discussion. And there's a lot of background noise, with people speaking in the hall, and this goes on for a few minutes. I started to get really bored. I continued watching, but kind of complained because it's a black video, camera facing the table, with just us talking in a noisy background with the occasional tapping of fingers on the table. I still watch, completely unfazed, and then my friend says, Did you notice it? I'm still utterly confused and ask her what. She rewinds the video and instructs me to listen at a certain point of the video. All of this segment is in the noisy hall. I watch this 10 second segment roughly three times, 
and the moment I realized what she was directing me to pay attention to, my tone changed and I felt chill. Everyone is quiet, she said. At this point in the video, everyone suddenly just goes radio silent, and it's as if we're being completely watched and listened to for the next two minutes of the video. Then suddenly, everyone else's time unfreezes it appears, and a friend at another table alerts us to be quiet, and the announcement begins in the video. In the video, since the silence began, my friend alerting us is the first sound other than us talking. We spoke to our friend and he told us that we were speaking for like a few seconds while everyone was quiet. But then, when we showed him the video and aligned everything, he even felt confused, but disregarded it. I never knew how to take it, but the audio from the video is just so chilling. It's not some form of noise cancellation on her iPhone, iPhone 7 at the time, because it was picking up all the audio for a good amount of time. It's just this brief period where everyone else is silent, and it's just us talking. It's hard to explain. I already feel like I'm missing points to explain the experience, but it is what it is. We were both fascinated and terrified of it. It was just as if the world and their souls stopped, and they decided to focus on our conversation. Hi all. The story I'm about to tell you happened about a year ago. One night, my girlfriend and I come home from a long day of work, and we decided to do what we normally do to de-stress, which is take a bath together. I started the bath, lit the candles, and slowly started to add the bubble bath soap and bath salts. The specific bath salts I was using this time were a gift from my girlfriend a few months prior, and we barely have gotten used to it. It was locally made, and I believe that it was just a mix of pink salts and flower petals, and it came in a glass cylinder jar. It may or may not have had little quartz crystals in it, but I'm not quite sure about that detail. The bath was prepared, my girlfriend and I get undressed, and then she turns the lights off. It wasn't too dark because of the glow of the candles, they lit the small bathroom pretty well. My girlfriend gets in first with no issue, but then, when I step into the full tub, I hadn't realized that I left the bath salts on the edge of the tub. I bumped into the glass jar of bath salts, knocking it over next to the toilet, the loud noise of glass shattering spooking my girlfriend and myself. We both look down and see the bath salts all over the ground, glass broken in pieces, even behind the toilet. We both sigh in disappointment, like, of course. We were both so tired after our bath that we decided to leave the mess for tonight and clean it first thing in the morning. Our roommate was asleep, so we didn't tell him, but it was out of the way enough that nobody would step on it in the middle of the night. The next morning, my girlfriend and I go sit in the living room to talk. Our roommate was in the washroom. A while later, he comes out of the washroom, and what he says next made our stomachs drop. There he was, standing there with the same jar of bath salts that we knocked down and broke the night before in his hand. He was like, Hey, guys, um, I found this on the floor. What the hell? My girl and I told him the whole story, and he just laughed and seemed kind of unimpressed, like, oh, uh, weird. But we just looked at each other like there's no way that we imagined it. We heard it. We saw it. We touched it. The next day it was fixed like it had never fell. It couldn't have been anything else because there wasn't even a mess. Our roommate didn't see anything either. 
I know this may not be exciting to you, but to this day, that is the craziest, most unexplainable instance that we've ever been through. I have so many questions. Why did the glass fix itself? How did this happen overnight? What is the meaning of it, if there is any at all? Maybe it was a shared hallucination, but how? We weren't that tired, or warm. Did we wake up in a slightly different universe where we never broke the glass? I don't know, but I genuinely think this might be a glitch in the Matrix. Thanks for reading my story, if you made it this far. I hope that it was entertaining for you. I know y'all don't know me, but this really did happen. And I really would like to read somebody else's take on why or how all this happened. My girl and I still talk about it to this day, and do not know what to make of it. I need explanations. My partner, sibling, and I were on vacation. We got there later than anticipated our first day, but we still really wanted to see the beach, even though it closed within the hour. We drove to the nearest access, hiked down the dune, and spent about 30 minutes sitting by the water. No one else was there. The waves kept getting more intense and we decided the water was telling us it's time to leave. I looked at the time as we were getting up, 11.12pm. We picked up our stuff, and my sibling looked at their phone just before we began trekking back, 11.15pm. Now, it was a pretty lengthy and steep hike back to the dune, and my sibling has a bum leg. It took us about 5 minutes to get from the car, 10.42 when we got out, down the dune, and to the beach, 10.47 when we'd been on the beach for seconds to a minute. My partner had gone back up to their car almost immediately, and they texted me, by the way, it's gonna take you 20 minutes to get back up, because it had taken them a while. They're also more physically fit than my sibling or myself. I didn't get the text till we were back in the car due to no signal, though. So, again, it took us three minutes to clean up our stuff, and it was 11.15 when we began going back. About halfway up, we had to stop and sit on a bench for at least two to three minutes to catch our breath, drink some water, cool down, and rest my sibling's leg. We weren't moving fast by any means whatsoever. We had to stop again and stand for a minute before reaching the top. We reached the top, got in the car, and the time on our phones said 11.19pm. The time on the car's clock said 11.26pm, which has purposely been 7 minutes fast for years. My sibling immediately said, we shifted realities. And honestly, that's the only logical explanation I can come up with. There's no way we both read our phones incorrectly. They're both military time too, if that matters. So, how the hell did we make it back up in less time than it took us to get down? The OP to the story requested that I do read some of the comments in order to add some extra context. One person asked, how long did it feel like it took you to go up? And they responded, At least 15 minutes. More like 20. We both made the comment that it felt like we sat on the bench for at least 5 minutes too. I was fully expecting for it to be 11.35 to 11.45 when we got back to the car. My gut's internal clock was having a toss-up between 11.47 or 11.53 as I was reaching for the door handle, anticipating the exact time. I also remember crossing my fingers that it wasn't after midnight. It seemed to take forever, and I honestly would have believed it if it had been after midnight. I was anxious that it was taking us as long as it was, and I was expecting my partner to show up any moment because we'd been gone forever. Looking back, 
how that walk back felt in the moment was weird as hell. It felt like time slowed way down, and we were moving so slowly. Internally, we were both fighting for our lives, too, but I figured it was because we were not necessarily in shape. We both very likely have POTS, and my sibling's leg was really messed up. A dislocated knee that they deal with regularly, but had issues getting it back relocated that time, and wasn't fully mobile. I could feel every bit of blood and tissue, every vibration in my body, and I was hyper aware of my heart, the blood pumping through it, what the beats felt like deep in my chest. And then, it felt like I could follow the blood throughout my body. My head slash thinking process felt weird, really fuzzy, jelly, slow, in the deepest part of my brain. But I don't know how to describe it. It was kind of like everything around me was blurred out because there was so much going on within. Like my tissues had become TV static, and focusing on them slash my ability to think was the only way to keep it all together and make it. I can't speak for my siblings' experience, I'm gonna ask them more about it though, but shortly after we sat down we talked about how fast and hard our hearts were beating how odd it all felt, and about how it stopped all of a sudden and seemed to be in balance again, just like that. And then we started walking again and the pressurized hyper-aware feeling happened again. For me, it was definitely different from being out of breath due to physical activity. And then, this time before we stopped and stood for a few seconds, it all stopped like nothing had ever been out of balance which is also very different from our typical experiences with physical exercise. It was just so weird, and we talked about how weird it was in the moment. I guess it could definitely just be oxygen deprivation and or blood pressure fluctuation, but it was so strange. Hi Raven, first I would like to say thank you for your videos. They always help me pass the time while working and it's much appreciated. Now on to the story. I've been into Wicca since I was a teenager. It gave me a sense of hope and purpose and also kept me motivated to accomplish my goals. I used to frequent a local metaphysical shop, a witch store all throughout my teenage and currently adult years. I would go there to buy books, crystals, herbs, or whatever else I needed for spells or ritual work. After having a daughter in my adult years, I seldom visited the store as it was rather far away, but still kept up with my practices. When my daughter turned seven and started to show an interest in crystals, I decided it would be a great time to take her to the witch store and show her what I was into. Walking into the store, you are surrounded by peaceful, serene music, a cat that wanders around the shop, and many beautiful and sacred crystals, herbs, talismans, and more. My daughter's attention was immediately focused in on the crystals and stones as soon as we entered the store. She asked me if she could pick one out. I told her to see the little tag by each stone to see what they represent and mean. I said that she can only get one as they are all in different price ranges and I don't have a big budget. I told her to pick out the one that spoke to her the most, and she ended up picking out a beautiful squared piece of moonstone. It was small and in a cubed shape, and was a beautiful, clear, almost iridescent quality. I personally didn't own one, so I thought it was a great choice, and completely her own. The owner at the shop also told her that it was a great choice for her first real stone, and explained what its properties were and what it was good for. She gave her a small woven bag that the stone fit in, and my daughter was thrilled. We got home later that day, 
and I told my daughter to display her stone somewhere that could remind her of our time in the witch store. She put the stone in her dresser with her other small mementos, and that was that. A few weeks later, she told me that she had lost the moonstone. It wasn't a huge surprise because children are known to lose things, but it was a bit upsetting as it was a special moment between mother and daughter. I spent the evening helping her look for it to no avail. We must have looked for an hour in her room, and it turned up nothing. We couldn't even find the small bag that it was originally in. We even checked behind and under the dresser and still couldn't find it. About a week later, I had given up any hope trying to find it, but kept wondering how it just seemingly disappeared into thin air, or what she could have possibly done with the stone. I was cleaning out the catch-all drawer that we all have, and actually found the square-shaped moonstone to my surprise. However, it wasn't in the bag that it came with, and I couldn't find the bag in the drawer either. My daughter came home from school, and I excitedly told her that I finally found the stone, but couldn't find the bag that it came with. She told me that she had actually found the stone herself, and that it was still in the bag. I showed her the stone that I found, and she pulled out the bag. I said there's no way the stone is in the bag, it's right here in my hand. She took out the stone, and sure enough, it was there. We compared the two stones, and the one I found was the same exact shape, size, and color, but without the little bag that it came in. I was lost for a moment. Wondering how I found the exact same stone when we had only purchased one of them at the Wicca shop. I remember the entire event of purchasing the stone, and the cost, so I was absolutely baffled. This wasn't a stone I've ever had before either. It was something she completely picked on her own as I wanted it to be meaningful for her. This left me with a lot of questions. Did the stone replicate itself somehow so I would eventually find it, knowing its meaning was a bond that I shared with my daughter? Did I will the stone to turn up in the most random of places? I'll never know. I just thought that we did not purchase two of them, and I never owned one before my daughter had purchased hers. My daughter was as blown away as I was. Now, having two of the exact same stone, I told her how we can each have one to remember this strange occurrence. We keep the two stones next to each other, now in a safe space, as a reminder of this experience. Was it magic? Or was it perhaps just another glitch in the Matrix? So. This happened today, the 7th of September, 2023. Leaving the dentist, I took my daughter to the pharmacy after a few errands. Once at the pharmacy, I waited in line to get to the counter. I handed over my daughter's prescription and went to sit and waited until it was ready. Once I sat down, I immediately remembered that I'd had a prescription of my own sent through to this pharmacy via email from my doctor two days beforehand, Tuesday, the 5th of September, but I just never got around to collecting it. The mum life. So, the mom and me thought that I should get it while I'm here, but seeing the queue that formed and knowing the process of writing my details down to verify, name, address, phone number, the lazy me kicked in and really didn't want to wait in line again and do the whole writing process. Although rather easy, I managed to convince myself that it belonged in the too hard basket at that moment, and I decided that it could wait until tomorrow. So, once satisfied with not doing what I should really do, I sat back, relaxed and continued to wait for my daughter's prescription. It was not 20 seconds after this internal debate that the pharmacist approached the counter to read out a name. The name she said caught me off guard, 
as it wasn't my daughter's name, nor did anyone else move that was waiting on scripts. I know that I heard the name, but I too queried if I actually heard it correctly. The name was repeated, and it was confirmed the name that I heard the first time. It was mine. You can imagine my confusion as I approached the counter. The pharmacist asked, Is that you? I replied, Well, yes, but I didn't ask for a prescription for myself. I was adamant that I didn't because I really could not be bothered with the standing again and then waiting again and the whole writing ordeal. The pharmacist proceeded to ask me to verbally verify my address and number. Then she says, Yep, this is for you. And I see the sticker attached to a paper bag that has all my medical details printed on it. I'm dumbfounded. Um, okay, I say, while well, I go back to my seat and think about how the hell that all happened. My daughter's script then became ready for collection a couple of minutes later. I was in the pharmacy for no more than 8 to 10 minutes at the very max, but that's really stretching it. I go to the car where my daughter is, and I cannot contain myself. I had the biggest grin and burst out to my daughter. I just had a glitch. My daughter is 22 and knows how much I love stories of glitches and Matrix happenings. She just nods in acknowledgement, not able to talk due to the extraction she just had. I get home and excitedly tell my 17-year-old, and she says, Mom, that's mad but is smiling, so I know she meant it as a compliment. And then, all I could think was, I cannot wait to get here and share it with you too. I'm just so content right this moment. I don't know what happened or how, but it most definitely made my day. A friend and I went to the lake yesterday. We both have camping chairs with little cooler bags attached to one arm. We like to sit with our chairs about a foot deep in the water. Because of where we sit, we know young children are going to splash. So, the cooler bag, which is mostly waterproof, works as storage and protection for our phones. Yesterday, an approximately three-year-old boy comes to me with the volleyball wanting to play catch. I happily oblige, which then attracted a second, third, and fourth boy. There was a lot of splashing. I checked my normally waterproof bag and found too much water to keep my phone safe. My friend said that she would put it in her bag. I handed it to her and watched her put it in her bag and zip it closed. While playing, she got up and went about ten feet into the water. I eventually joined her. We weren't far from our chairs, and they were in our sight the entire time. When we decided to get out and eat lunch, she said that she would grab the phones. I watched as she unzipped her bag, pulled her phone out, and then started rummaging to find my phone. It wasn't there. She took a few things out that she had in her bag, even examined her phone to be sure that it was hers. We then started looking in the water and then over at our table. She told me to check my bag. I opened it up, and there's my phone, standing upside down in a little pool of water. Luckily, all of my phone's ports are on the bottom of my phone, so they were out of the water and it wasn't damaged. We rethought what could have happened multiple times, but we both remembered the conversation and the phone handoff in the exact same way. And that, my friends, was this week's collection of Glitch in the Matrix stories a collection of stories that make you think, wow, how strange. I'm done doing that. A, gl a, a collection of stories that makes you think, wow, that was some, some strange stuff that happened there. Stories that highlight, outline, 
and exemplify how weird our simulation truly can be. Also, how much the code needs to be updated. Who wrote this stuff? Wow, they hard-coded variables, they named variables with reserved names, it's just... Ugh. Anyways, uh, hopefully you all enjoyed this collection of glitchy goodness. Somebody requested that I say that because I used to say it in the podcast episodes, and apparently I forgot it. So, there's that. Um, meow, what was I saying? Oh yeah, hopefully you all enjoyed this collection of stories. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button, as that does help more than you'll ever know. That and commenting are two of the biggest things you can do to help any channel that you personally enjoy. Commenting requires um, being social, which, based on a poll that I recently ran, not a lot of you like to do, so I get it. Um, but doing the thumbs up, not so much. Just uh, just shows me you enjoyed the video, shows YouTube you liked it, tells them that, hey, this video might actually be good, and then they push it harder, which makes me happy. And then I'm happy and do more videos, and then you're happy because I do more videos, and YouTube's happy because they get a cut of the ad revenue. Um, that was silly of me to say. Anyways, thumbs up. If you're new to the channel and liked what you heard, please consider subscribing. That also helps a lot. Um, you can also do join memberships or super chats. Nope, super thanks in this case, because it's not a, not a live stream. Uh, both those are here on YouTube. One of those is just a tip to the channel. That's the super thanks. The joining makes you a member to my membership page, which gives you early access to content that is early up, as well as access to some fun emojis whenever I do live stream and in comments. They're actually pretty cool. I made them myself, so. Um, you can also join Patreon, we get early access to content like this, and other things, depending on what level you sign up for. The $10 a month uh, level gets you a poster, signed by me. I will sign it Raven, and they're cool. You gotta be a Patreon for at least three months, though. And the only reason I do that is because it costs me around $30 to get the posters shipped to me and then shipped out. Printed, shipped, and then shipped. So... Being a patron for three months, you get the poster, and I don't make any money. That's fine by me, though. It's all about you guys. That's why I do this. So, yeah. Um, and then lastly, the commenting thingy that I mentioned earlier, you can do what we call the word of the week, or the wow, or wadu. Wadu? Wodu? Wow? Anyway. Um, last week, the word was foster. And a significant number of you left me a comment with the word Foster. So, on the screen right now is the collection of screenshots that I grabbed from that video's comment section from the people who left the word Foster at a comment. Look at you all. Fostering the community, the sense of community that I've created with this beautiful channel. Thank you. I hope you know that I appreciate that more than I am willing to state in a video. And that made no sense, except it for what it is. Thank you to each and every single one of you for going above and beyond and leaving me a comment with the word of the week. You guys are amazing. Now, this week, the word of the week is rejuvenate. R-E-J-U-V-E-N-A-T-E, -E, which is to make young or youthful again, give new vigor to, to restore to an original or new state, or to stimulate a stream or to renewed erosive activity, especially by uplift, and fun fact, rejuvenate originated as a combina com com combination combination of the prefix re, which means again, with the Latin parent of juvenile or junior, which is juvenus, meaning young. So rejuvenate literally means to make young again. There you go. Use that and get featured next week, so long as you get the comment to me before the upcoming Sunday. Now. I want to say thank you to every single one of you for listening to this point. I hope you know you are loved, you are valid, you are important to the best you that you can be. Do not forget it. Do not let anyone tell you otherwise. And until I see you again, my friends, much love, and of course, sleep well.